weekly series and a new presenting team now on BBC One. It's the return of Crime Watch. The attempted abduction of a British serviceman. I knew he was trying to drag me towards that open door and I knew what I had to do to get away. I was fighting for my life. A 14-year-old girl murdered. There's always something missing. And there'll always be something missing. And that something is my daughter. And the dangers of online dating. I could get her full name, lots more photographs of her, and a possible address. Live from RAF Marham, this is Crime Watch. Good evening and welcome to Crime Watch. For the first time, we are travelling the country, broadcasting from major crime scenes across the UK. We're starting here at RAF Marham in Norfolk, home to the Air Force's Tornado Squadrons and the location of the attempted abduction of a British airman just a few weeks ago. We'll have a full reconstruction shortly. But first, Tina Dahili is in our incident room with more of what's in store tonight. We're out on the road, but we still have police officers standing by to take your calls. Can you help to find our latest batch of wanted faces and identify crooks caught on CCTV? Plus, the inside story of how the murder of 17-year-old Melanie Rhodes was finally brought to justice after three decades, thanks to advances in forensic science and tenacious detective work. When I first came into the investigation, it just gripped me. And like everyone who'd gone before me and everyone who I worked with at the time, I wanted to be part of the team that solved it. This is one of the RAF's largest and busiest air bases. Marham is home to three squadrons of Tornado aircraft currently flying operations in the Middle East and almost 10,000 service personnel and support staff. It was a mile away from here on the 20th of July that one airman out for a run along a country road encountered something that, despite years of military service, shocked him to his core. I was like, what the hell is going on? I didn't see anyone around. I knew I was on my own. It's the what ifs, you know? Not being able to see my wife again. And not being able to see my family again. The Norfolk village of Marham is the site of one of the RAF's largest bases. From here, they provide air support for British military operations across the world. It's also home to an airman with more than 12 years active service. To protect his identity, his words are spoken by an actor. Being in the services, it's a job that takes you all over the world. The best part is being at home. We deploy to different places and we get put in situations that your average civilian would not be put in. But when you come home, you think you're in relative safety. Well, I was let off early from work. I came home. I went into the kitchen and made myself a juice. I sat on the sofa and put the TV on and chilled for 20 minutes and I looked outside. I realised that the weather was really nice, so I'd better drag my bum off the sofa and go for a run. I have to do it because of my job. See, being in the military, you have to keep fit. The day in particular was about 28 degrees. Blue skies, no wind. So it was a nice summer's day, really. I was listening to heavy metal music, just to give myself that little bit extra motivation. It was 14.55. I remember specifically looking at my watch. 
because I like to know how quickly I'm running to see how I can improve my run. This is the first time I ran that route alone. Usually I run with my wife or someone else. I like running with a partner because it pushes you more. But this time there was no one to run with, so I decided to go out on my own. Sometimes I enjoy it, sometimes I don't. But yeah, it's time to yourself, you know? The beginning of the run, you're thinking about the end of it, aren't you? That's probably what I was thinking about. There was absolutely nothing out of the ordinary happening. It was a completely normal day. I was running uphill and usually I up my pace just to put that last bit of effort in to push myself to the max. I was really, really fatigued. There was a dark coloured people carrier on the opposite side of the road. I didn't really notice it at first. And I saw this guy get out. He was a large stocky fella, 6'2 or 6'3. He was maybe 16 or 17 stone. He definitely went to the gym. I was like, what the hell is going on? Well, I knew something was up, but I couldn't make out what he was saying because my headphones were on so loud. I knew that he was angry. I knew he was trying to drag me towards that open door, and I knew what I had to do to get away. I was fighting for my life. I managed to get my right arm across his chest pushing him away, which gave me enough room to headbutt him. He still had hold of my left arm. I had enough room, so I hit him. That's when I noticed the second guy coming around the back of the car. It was just adrenaline, and when I saw the knife, I was like, here we go. And I took up a defensive position because I thought he was going to come at me. We looked at each other. We looked at each other for about three seconds, I guess. That two to three seconds, I'll never forget that. I didn't see anyone around. I knew I was on my own then. He took a look at his unconscious friend on the floor and took a look at me, and he was like, no. As soon as he dropped that knife, I turned and ran. It's the what-ifs. It didn't happen, and thank God it didn't happen. But it's the what-ifs, you know? Not being able to see my wife again. And not being able to see my family again. I'm confident that if they did get me in that car, it would have been me. This whole event has turned my world upside down. I'm not scared to go shopping or go for a run or anything like that. I won't let this stop me from doing things I need to do, but it does affect you emotionally. I was phoning my wife. That's when the realization sort of hit. The outcome could have been a lot more severe. It's important that they are caught. They can't get away with it. They need to know that they're going to be brought to justice for it. A worrying case indeed. We will take a look at how you can help in just a moment. But earlier I went to look around the crime scene itself with the lead officer on the case, Detective Superintendent Paul Durham. The incident took place at the edge of Marham Village on Squires Hill, just a mile down the road from where we are now. It's very quiet here, so it seems like the ideal place for an ambush. Well, yes, it is. As you can see, the visibility is very restricted. There's a heavy tree cover. Uh, down there are a series of S-bends which restrict the line of sight. And as we walk up the hill, we can see again that the view is blocked by the, the rise in the hill. And he's running on this side. He's running up the pavement here. He is. He's running along this pavement that we're walking along right at this moment in time. There is a, a, a drain hole cover just up here on the right-hand side. And it's as he, is, as he approaches that drain hole cover that he first becomes aware of the vehicle and the men on the right-hand side. 
Okay. Their vehicle would have been parked on that side of the road, facing down the hill, so facing him as he ran towards them. And, and no cars yet, so they were able to, to try and take him? Well, seemingly so. Um, and certainly once the attack had finished, um, the runner ran as fast as he could up the hill back towards the camp. Well, Paul is with me now live and incredibly brave of this, this airman to fight off the two attackers. It could have been a lot worse, couldn't it? Very brave indeed, especially when you consider that he would have been tired from having done his run. Um, and in a very isolated area, I think it could have been a lot worse than it was if it wasn't for his actions. Are we looking at the kind of terrorist incident which claimed the life of drummer Lee Rigby? Well, we're treating it as an attempted abduction, but we have been working with officers from the Counter-Terrorism Command, and I'm ruling nothing out. OK, now, Paul, you've got a couple of EFITs to show us. Yes, we have. Let's, let's, let's describe them now. Well, there were two men described. The first one is described as being six foot two inches tall, of heavy build, with a dark beard and hair that was longish on top. He would have been wearing a T-shirt with diagonal writing across the front of the T-shirt uh, and would have had, we think, some sort of injuries, visual injuries to the eye area as a result of being struck by the airman during the attack. The second man is described as being slimmer, 5 feet 10 inches tall, clean-shaven and with short head on the sides. One of the men, as we saw in the film, Paul, was armed with a knife. Do you know what kind of knife it was? Yes, we think it was one something like this. Um, it's described as being a military-type knife with a wide, short blade, black in colour, about two to three inches in length. And what's quite exciting for you here is you think you've got CCTV which will help. We have got some CCTV, which is from a store located not too far away from where the incident took place. Now, as you can see, it's not of the best quality, but in the top left corner, we're looking at a number of vehicles that pass through the uh, Squires Hill at about the material time. I'm very keen to identify the owners and the occupiers of those vehicles to find out what they saw immediately before and after the incident. Paul Durham, thank you very much indeed. Take another look at the EFITs. If you think you can help Paul and his team identify these two men, we would very much like to hear from you. Our new number is 08085 600 600. That's 08085 600 600. Calls are free from landlines and mobile phones. Thanks, Jeremy, and welcome inside our mobile incident studio. This is where detectives working on tonight's cases are taking your calls. They're already busy, and we'll check in with them on how things are going very soon. But first, it's time for tonight's CCTV roundup of crimes caught on camera. Watch carefully. A petrol station in Birmingham in April. Some friends have paused their journey home for a spot of shopping. They encounter a feisty group of males who start to talk to them. The man police are looking to trace is this angry guy in the blue t-shirt. Keep a close eye on him. A fight breaks out. One of the victims is quickly knocked unconscious, but that doesn't stop the angry man from giving him a kicking. And if that's not enough, while the other victim is sitting on the floor, the man runs over and starts kicking him too. He then starts throwing punches. West Midlands police need a name for this violent man. Call us now. It's a Friday evening at a fast food restaurant in Reading. But this man with the rucksack seems to be after more than a quick bite to eat. He heads straight for the men's, but changes his mind and leaves the toilet area. Seconds later, he's back and tries to kick a stool holding a door open out of the way. One final push and it swings shut. A 13-year-old girl walks into the women's toilet and is immediately followed by the man. According to police, a picture is taken of the girl from over a toilet cubicle. The man hastily makes his exit. Police would very much like to speak to him. If you know who he is, get in touch.
A woman is making a visit to a residential area of Notting Hill in West London when she's approached by two hooded men. Terrifyingly, they grab her in a chokehold. She tries to kick back. But look closely. One of the men pulls a ring from her finger and then puts it in his mouth. The two men then dump the now unconscious woman on the floor and make off. Thankfully, she made a full recovery. These men are dangerous, and police believe this wasn't their first ring robbery. Let us know if you can put names to these faces. A silver car pulls up outside a house in Cleebury Mortimer in Shropshire. A man gets out and checks to see if anyone is home. He's in luck, no one's in. So he sets to work trying to break through the patio doors. Look carefully and you can see him in the reflection of the TV. He searches the house, but what's he after? According to police, he's managed to nab a white jewelry box. But as he goes to leave, he gives us quite a view. He drives away, but not for long. Two minutes later, he speeds back up the drive and runs inside. Maybe he's looking for a belt for those trousers. He returns to the kitchen, this time with another haul in a pillowcase. Once he's finally got enough, he heads out. All in, he stole items and caused damage worth £16,000. If you can help crack this one, give us a bell. Call 08085 600 600 if you can help. Or you can text us on 63399. Just text CRIME and your message. Text will be charged at your standard message rate. Now, I can tell you that we've already had some interesting calls into the offices here. And throughout the programme and after we're off there, you can find all the latest developments as they happen on our new live updates page. Find it via the website. It's well worth a look. Now, around 7 million people in the UK look for love online. Most have honourable intentions and many end up enjoying successful dates and sometimes even marriages. But unfortunately, for some users of dating apps and websites, that is not always the case. In this special Crime Watch investigation, Radio 1 Newsbeat reporter Stefan Powell looks at the potential dangers of dating online. <laughs> Online dating is part of everyday life for millions of people in the UK and for most it's a safe, helpful and fun way to start a new relationship. As well as the more traditional dating websites, lots of us are now using apps on our phone as a convenient and easy way to meet someone new. I'm Stefan Powell and last year I made a documentary about dating apps which looked at how the technology is changing and the way we find sex and relationships. But in the last few years, there's been a number of disturbing cases, some including murder and rape, which have shown a darker side to online dating. Now, I want to find out what the potential dangers are and how people can stay safe when meeting others online. In October last year, 44-year-old Usha Patel was murdered by a man she'd met on a dating site. Miles Donnelly admitted killing the single mother after meeting face to face for the first time at her home in London. And in March, Jason Lawrence was found guilty of raping five women and attacking two others after targeting and contacting them through Match.com. I want to explore how the technology could be exploited by those with sinister intentions. So I'm setting up three fake profiles to see how people behave online. So I'm going to start off by setting up a profile on Match.com, one of the biggest sites in the UK. It's asking me for my relationship status, what you look like, where you're from. Now, I can put pretty much anything I want in here. I'm also trying free site and app Oasis and popular dating app Tinder. What I find will be analysed to highlight the potential risks that some people might unwittingly take. You reveal so much to these people, you get to know them really fast. They could be anyone behind their screen, like they could just be sending pictures of someone else. I imagine it can be quite easy to distort who you are. My experience, people are nice, but I think they're only after one thing. 
There's been a disturbing rise in reported rapes linked to dating sites and apps. The National Crime Agency say the numbers rose from 33 in 2009 to 184 in 2014. Now they've revealed it's gone up again to around 200 in the last year. There will be a small element of individuals that are going out with the predefined um, remit of rape. How do they perpetrate these offences? Well, they perpetrate them by getting you to be in the place that they want you to be in and for them to call all the shots. The majority of the offences have taken place at either the victim's home address or the offender's 71% plus, in fact. The problem is, with online dating, you develop a pseudo-intimacy that you wouldn't have done normally. And when you meet somebody for the first time, you're going to feel more comfortable and potentially let your guard down. Worryingly, the NCA suggests there may be a new type of offender utilising online dating platforms. Are we seeing overall more people being raped because this is a new capability? that perhaps some offenders wouldn't have carried out rapes until the point at which they have this ease of use. We just don't know the answer to that yet. But there's a, there's a poss strong possibility that that might be the case. So the online accounts have been up and running for a few days now, and it is surprising just how much information I can get my hands on by looking at other users' profiles. There was one example of someone on Tinder. I got her first name, her age, and where she worked on the site. And then, just by doing some basic digging online, I could get her full name, lots more photographs of her, and also a possible address for where she lived as well. Other risks said to be linked to dating online include fraud, stalking, and harassment. The number of crimes are extremely low compared to the millions of users, but campaigners say we still need to be aware. The internet doesn't create stalkers. We've had stalkers for hundreds and hundreds of years. The internet just makes um, a stalker's life easier. It gives them access to a lot of information that they can gain without leaving their own home. If you've disclosed your surname, then it's very easy for somebody to actually get you a full postal address to the, to the point where you can get perpetrators turning up at your property. We all have a huge digital footprint and it's about managing that if we can, but also about bringing the perpetrators to book for this. It's thought many of us behave differently online to when meeting people face to face. We see an escalation in building the relationship. We see uh, self-disclosure happening quickly. We see trust happening quickly. And also, specifically in terms of dating, you will see the exchanges of texts that are more intimate or have sexualized content more quickly than will happen in the real world. The offender will often use very persuasive or coercive techniques to get their date to move to a private location. And very often, the victim has agreed because they do feel that they know this person. Now, Rachel, I've been on um, three different sites for just over a week. And in that time, I've had about 15 conversations with, with different people. Now, over half of the people that we spoke to have given us information that has led us to phone numbers, addresses, where they work. Um, what do you make of the results? It doesn't surprise me at all. I expected that people would give information out um, almost without prompting because I think as individuals we are quite trusting and we don't expect to be communicating with a stalker online. So if we take a look at uh, this conversation we're having with, with someone um, just yesterday, um, now you can see just from this that I've got, she's gone to a barbecue this weekend, I know where she lives uh, and where she studies. Now, we're not saying that she's doing anything wrong by sharing this information, but you can do a lot with it, can't you? The wrong person can do an awful lot with that information. Um, we should be able to put whatever we like online, um, and, and it's not the victim's fault. The responsibility is the stalkers, isn't it? But. You need to be aware of what somebody can use that information um, to do. So what I found is concerning, but the NCA also highlight the risks of meeting privately on a first date. So I decided to invite six of those we've been speaking to to do just that. Despite very little online contact, two agreed. 
Neither of them knew my true identity. Two others agreed to meet, but only in public. The others said no. Of course, incidents linked to online dating are never the victim's fault. But how do the NCA suggest we minimize the potential risks? Get to know the person, not the profile. I would always be guarded about how much informa personal information I give to an individual until you fully know who they are. For the first dates, always meet in public. Make sure you say what it is you want from the dates. Always make your own way to the date and try not to accept a lift home. There are many successful dates thanks to the internet every day in the UK. But judging by what I've seen, we should also be aware that not everyone has the best intentions when it comes to finding romance. Well, following our investigation, Match.com, who also own Tinder, told us they are no more immune from people with bad intentions than other social media sites and society at large. They say they have a zero-tolerance policy for reports of serious offences and encourage anyone who's felt exposed to unsafe behaviour to immediately contact the police. Oasis.com said it always urges members to be careful when meeting new people and says they should use the same caution as they would in any other social context, such as a bar or a party. It also encourages members to report suspicious profiles and behavior. The companies all strongly urge users to follow the safety guidelines outlined on their websites. You can also find lots of advice on our website or at getsafeonline.org. Right, still to come tonight, a mother's search for justice for her daughter murdered at 14. I looked at the window and the police officer and I knew, I knew then. It's just a pain in my heart. I just. I just knew it was, it was hard. But we've our wanted faces first, starting with Isaiah Wright Young, also known as Isis or Bro. He's wanted in relation to the murder of a man who was shot in the face in the Ladywood area of Birmingham. Wright Young is 36, has links to the West Midlands and London, and has a half-inch scar above his left eyebrow. He's described as dangerous, so don't approach him. Just dial 999. Next is 30-year-old Zishan Qureshi. He was questioned by detectives in connection with the rape of a woman at the sheltered accommodation where he'd worked. He was released on police bail but has failed to return. Qureshi may now be clean-shaven with longer hair. He has links to London and the West Midlands. Face number three is Michael Philip Libri, or you may know him as Stephen Bugman or Sonic. The 36-year-old was arrested in connection with the alleged sexual assault of a young girl and released on police bail, but he's failed to return for further questioning. Libri has links to Edinburgh, Suffolk, Norwich, Chester, North Wales and Essex. And finally for now is Darren Clevis Cohen. Detectives in Gloucestershire want to speak to him in connection with an attack in a nightclub in which a man was slashed across the face. Cohen's 35, has a Birmingham accent and links to Gloucestershire and the West Midlands. If you know where any of tonight's faces might be, please do get in touch using the numbers on the screen. We'll go through the rest of the lineup a little later. A fortnight ago marked 20 years since schoolgirl Caroline Glacken was murdered. The 14-year-old from Bon Hill, just north of Dumbarton, was on her way to see her boyfriend in the early hours of the 25th of August 1996 when she was brutally attacked. Tonight, Caroline's mother speaks about the day life stood still and appeals for your help for answers. We were just here to ask anybody that saw anything, heard anything. She was my only way. Just somebody must know something. The press conference was quite harrowing. I had to just 
totally concentrate on why I was there. Um, but it was like looking in on somebody that was not It was me, but it was not me. It's much easier then to think, right, that they'll get somebody. With 20 years down the line, to have that hope is harder. A huge police operation got underway, but despite extensive inquiries and a national public appeal, detectives drew a blank. Four months later, they turned to Crime Watch. The reconstruction started with Caroline's journey home along the River Leven on Saturday, the 24th of August at 9 p.m. It was her mother Margaret's 40th birthday the next day, and as she prepared to go out and celebrate, Caroline again left the house, this time to meet her best friend Joanne. I asked her where she was going, she said, I'm going to get Joanne. And I said, right, but mind your time, mind and be back. Um, and it's the usual, oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and that was the last I saw her. For the next few hours, Caroline and Joanne drifted around the Bonhill estate, meeting friends. Joanne and two others went home to watch videos whilst Caroline walked alone to go to her boyfriend's house in Renton on the other side of the River Leven. It wasn't until 4 p.m. the next day, Sunday the 25th of August, that the grim discovery was made. Caroline's body was in the water. She had been violently attacked and had been dead for some hours. An anxious Margaret, who'd already reported her missing, received the worst news possible just a few hours later. I looked at the window and there was a police officer with a policewoman, and I knew, I knew then. I just, you know, you just, I just knew. Um, I've, got, I've got this unbelievable pain, which I can still feel. Um, sorry. It's just a pain in my heart. I just just knew it was, it was her. Um, they came up and they asked about her um, clothing, which she'd on. Told them, and they had said then that they believed that it was her, but they'd have to identify it. Um, so, of course, by this time, it is my birthday. Um, so life didn't begin at 40. Um, for me, it basically ended. Joanne Menzies was Caroline's best friend. As a grief-stricken 14-year-old, she bravely took part in the reconstruction herself. It was important to me because when me and Caroline were together that night, people, if I was an actress, um, people are not going to know the actress. I would do anything to help the character in it. This is the area where me and Caroline actually parted. Caroline gave me a kiss and a cuddle and then said, I'll see you in a wee while. And she proceeded to walk down the stairs, down towards the Black Bridge to meet her boyfriend. 20 years on, she still cannot fully accept what happened that night. I felt guilty. Why did I not go with her? Maybe I could have helped her. The day they killed Caroline, they killed my only friend. I still, to this day, don't have a best friend. I'm a mother. And I should have been there to protect her. I should make things right. So this is my way. Trying to make things right. Trying to help to solve it. But I can't do that on my own. I need people to come forward. This is a child killer. This is the worst of the worst. You can't get any worse than this. It's people killing children. And Caroline was only a child. She's only 14. And these people 
should now stand up and actually finally be counted <clears throat> as a human being and not like not hiding a second secret. The two main answers that I need is who and why. Um, why is beyond me. Um, I, I just don't know. What would make somebody want to kill a 14-year-old lassie? There's always something missing. And there'll always be something missing. And that something is my daughter. Such a sad case. Detective Superintendent Jim Kerr from Police Scotland joins us now. You are still hoping to hear from witnesses. Tell us more about the route she took that night. Yes, yeah, so just after midnight on Sunday, the 25th of August 1996, Caroline left the Bonhill shops, went down uh, into Dillichip uh, Loan, as you can see there on the monitor. Uh, across the Dillichip Bridge, commonly known as the Black Bridge, no longer there now, unfortunately, and down the towpath. So we left the Bonhill shops and across the, the Dillichip part there, having left um, Joanne there uh, for the last time. And you have Jim, an e-fit of someone you really want to trace. Yes, when Caroline was uh, walking along mm. Dillichip Lawn, we have a witness who saw a man, sharp features, um, wearing a green hooded jacket, as you can see there. He's five feet six in height, 20 to 25 years of age. He's not came forward. We could really do with tracing him tonight. And you've got any other sightings on the night that are important? Yes, about quarter to one, two men, one wearing a green or blue hooded top, running in Bank Street near to the, what was then the Kippen Dairy. Again, despite repeated appeals over the last 20 years, those two men haven't come forward either, but they could be vital witnesses for us. And I gather, Jim, you believe that in those communities of Bonhill and Renton is where the answer lies? Uh, uh, undoubtedly. Um, you know, we are we're aware that uh, allegiances change would appeal to anyone who had hesitation at the time to come forward and contact us tonight. There was a lot of speculation at the time. The community, some of which made up their minds as to what had happened and decided not to contact us. You know, the big issue here is there's a 14 year old child murdered in the banks of the river leaving. So we'd urge the people to get in touch with us. Thank you, Detective Superintendent, very much indeed. If you do have any information which could help bring closure to this family of a murdered child, please get in touch. Call us now on our new number. It is 08085 600 600. Or if you prefer, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously. They're on 0800 555 one. Also, if you've been a victim of any crime, you may want to speak to Victim Support. They're on 0808 1689 one. All the contact details, including a dedicated email address for Jim and his team, are on the website. Tina. Let's just catch up now on new developments since we've been on air. Of course, we are live from RAF Marham, appealing for information about the attempted abduction of a serviceman. Detective Superintendent Paul Durham is leading the case and has been taking calls from our viewers. What's come in so far, Paul? Well, I've had a pleasing response so far. There's a number of calls um, reporting sightings of um, people they think match the description of the EFIT. But a particular note, we're getting some names put to those images as well which is uh, obviously very important to us at the moment. Those e-fits are so important and those detailed descriptions. Paul, thank you very much for now. Brilliant to hear that there, there may be some movement there. Thank you, Tina. Keep the calls coming in. Also, still to come tonight, the 30-year quest to find 17-year-old Melanie Rhodes' killer. The trail of blood, it's almost like something out of an Agatha Christie, isn't it? There's this trail of blood leading away. So whose blood is that? More wanted faces first, though, starting with Yasser Hussein. He was on trial for 13 counts of money laundering and perverting the course of justice after setting up a company selling energy drinks despite not having any to sell. He didn't hang around to receive his seven-and-a-half-year jail sentence and is now on the run. Hussein is 35 and has links to Bradford, Dubai and Pakistan. Next is 29-year-old Adam James Wood. Detectives in Merseyside want to question him after firearms and a large quantity of drugs were discovered at his home. Wood has links to Liverpool and Dublin and has the name Kiara tattooed on his neck. 
This unhappy looking man is Jonathan Yeo, although he may be using the surname Simmons. Detectives want to question him in connection to the supply of heroin and crack cocaine in the Western Supermare area of Somerset. Yeo is 44 and has numerous tattoos, including the name Julie on his neck and John on his left arm. He also has a bulldog and panther's head on his right arm. He has friends and family in Weston as well as Exeter. He is described as violent, so do not approach. Just dial 999 if you know where he is. And finally, we have Ashley Allendad, although police believe he may be using a different name. He was sentenced to five years in jail for his role in the theft of up to £52 million worth of artefacts from museums across the UK. Dad didn't turn up to hear his sentence, though, and is now on the run. He is 35 and has a West Midlands accent. If you know where any of tonight's faces are, please get in touch using the numbers on the screen. Of course, you can also take another look on the Crime Watch website. Time for some updates on previous cases now. And since our last program, you've helped put dozens of criminals behind bars. There are just too many cases to list them all. So here is a small selection for you, starting with the murder of 34-year-old Tipu Sultan. Now, we featured his case in May 2015 after he was shot dead at the family's takeaway in South Shields. Well, your calls helped Northumbria detectives to arrest 47-year-old Michael McDougall and 24-year-old Michael Mullen for Tipu's murder. McDougall has now been sentenced to a minimum of 34 years, with Mullen receiving 12 years for manslaughter. Tipu's family wanted to say thank you to everyone who helped. We've got justice, and yes, it's not going to make him bring. It's not going to bring him back, but it's given us a bit of sense of relief facing their men. That took someone away from us. It's probably one of the hardest things that I've came across in my life as well. Thank you so much for your crucial calls. Fantastic work. A man who raped and murdered a 17-year-old girl in her home 34 years ago has also been jailed. The case of Yanula Iani featured twice on the programme after she was murdered whilst alone at the family home in Hampstead in North London in August 1982. Well, a DNA breakthrough led to the conviction in July this year of 56-year-old James Warnock. He's now starting 25 years behind bars. You have also helped detectives solve a number of the CCTV cases, including catching one of the men responsible for this callous theft we featured in March. An 88-year-old pensioner's home was broken into and thousands of pounds worth of valuables, including war medals, stolen. Well, you called in to name 30-year-old Sean Creddy Price. He pleaded guilty in August to the burglary and other offences and was jailed for five years and eight months. A great result. Plus, you've helped to put all of these wanted faces behind bars. Amongst them are people wanted for some very serious offences. All in, they received sentences totaling almost 60 years. One of them, 52-year-old Kara Michael Iffian, was wanted for raping a vulnerable woman. You gave police the information they needed to track him down, and he's now been jailed for 10 years. We also have Haik Madian, 43, who's been jailed for 16 years for stealing almost £80,000 in armed robberies at travel agents across the UK. And 32-year-old Miles Phillips, who handed himself into police after his mum saw him on Crime Watch in February. He pleaded guilty to drugs offences and was jailed for six years and four months. Just a small selection of some of the amazing results we've had recently, thanks to you. Melanie Road was just 17 when she was attacked as she made her way home from a nightclub in Bath in 1984. She was stabbed 26 times and died a short distance from the safety of her family home. Melanie was discovered in the early hours of the morning by a milkman and it was the start of what would become one of the UK's longest running and most challenging police investigations. Melanie. Melanie? 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 On Saturday, the 9th of June, 1984, the body of a young woman was found in the Lansdowne area of Bath. 
she had been brutally murdered. The hunt for the killer would span decades, involving hundreds of police officers and multiple investigation teams. The whole city of Bath was affected. I don't think they could believe that such a thing had happened in their city. The task facing us was massive. I always had the feeling it was going to be a matter of time. It just gripped me. And like everyone who'd gone before me and everyone who I worked with at the time, I wanted to be part of the team that solved it. One of the first people on the scene was Chief Inspector John Smith. I was in charge of scenes of crime at force headquarters. I was in the office, actually, at the time. I had a call to the office that uh, there was a serious crime had occurred in Bath. It was obvious that there had been a struggle. It's very sad because she was a young girl. No, no one wants to deal with that sort of crime, but that was that was what was there and that was what we had to deal with. Our job was to protect any evidence that was available and make sure that that evidence was treated properly. Well, she'd suffered multiple stab wounds and that was clear to see where she was lying there on the ground. And it was obviously a violent death and not something that we experience very often, fortunately. And the obvious question is who's responsible. But it wasn't only the killer who needed to be identified. The only clue the police had to the victim was a key ring found near her body with the name Melanie on it. Police started driving around the streets and they had a loud hailer attached to their car. Melanie? and they were basically just saying, does anybody know Melanie. of a Melanie? We're trying to find a Melanie. Melanie. Her mum remembers it vividly even today, going out and knocking on the back of the car as it's just about to drive off, saying, we've got a Melanie, we've got a daughter called Melanie, and she hasn't come home. Melanie's family have written about the impact that their tragic loss has had on them. For her sister, Karen, even today, the grief is very raw. I'd always longed for a baby sister. And when she was born, I thought all my prayers had been answered. She was pretty, sweet, and clever. We used to call her Little Duckling. With her NHS glasses, with a patch over one eye, I knew she was going to turn into a beautiful swan one day. 17-year-old Melanie Road was the youngest of three. She lived with her parents, Jean and Anthony, in the Lansdowne area of Bath. She had dreams and wishes about being married, having children. That last morning, she bathed and dressed her youngest niece, a baby of just six weeks at the time. Heartbreakingly, her body was found just 200 metres from her home. She had been raped and stabbed 26 times. The last time I saw her was at 5 p.m. outside the Francis Hotel. I remember it perfectly. She leant over and kissed me on the cheek to say goodbye. She was going off to play tennis with her friends and she was looking forward to going out that evening. She had her whole life ahead of her. The whole world was opening up for her. Police now knew the name of the victim, but who had so brutally cut her life short? Would a trail of blood left at the scene lead the police to her killer? In 1984, the principles are the same. It's all about methodology and being absolutely specific around what you're doing. And so you start, and they would have started with Melanie herself in situ there and looked around. There's a blood trail that seems to lead away from the body and goes out of St. Stephen's Court and out onto St. Stephen's Road. And although the spots were very, very small, at the beginning in St. Stephen's Court, there were lots of them. And then as they went down the road, they followed them all the way down the road to a set of steps and then out onto Camden Crescent. 
My senior crime officers were told that to follow each trail, mark each spot, and then it would be swapped. It was essential that it was marked and preserved certainly for future, future evidential use. It's almost like something out of an Agatha Christie, isn't it? There's this trail of blood leading away. So whose blood is it? All the blood was blood group A. Uh, Melanie was blood group A. Uh, but they had a special test that they could do that they called PGM, and that's all to do with the proteins in the blood. And from that, they managed to distinguish that actually the blood came from two people. And those two people, was one was Melanie, and the other person was the offender. And even in 1984, they established that only 3% of the population actually had that blood grouping. So it, the parameters were narrowed down, but of course not enough if you didn't know who your suspect was. A full-scale manhunt began. In the first year of the investigation, 94 people were arrested, but no one was charged. I think the crux of it is, is they did so much work at the beginning, there wasn't any more to be done. There wasn't any more to be dug out and be found. If it was to be had, somebody had to bring it to us. And there was a lot of publicity again around the anniversary in 1985 in order to see could we generate any new information. And at that point, they decided that that was it, that they would scale it down. Police were desperate to find Melanie's killer, yet faced with nothing but dead ends. But with the passage of time, developments in science and technology offered investigators new hope. In 1988, DNA started being used in casework, and by 1995, a national database was set up so DNA evidence could be checked against offenders' profiles. Swabs and clothing from the crime scene had been meticulously stored for 11 years. As a result, scientists were still able to extract a partial DNA profile from them. It must have been quite exciting times then, and I can imagine them sat there thinking, just wait a day or two and we'll be told our man's on the database. And that time came and they were told no DNA that matches your crime scene. Once again, the investigators' hopes were dashed. Five years later, another development in technology would offer a possible answer. My main involvement directly with the case came around about the year 2000 when I became a major crime specialist advisor. And part of my role was to review old murder cases to see if there was any way we could improve or, or get a better DNA profile. So I then had to review what we still held at the lab, what might be still available with the police, to see if we could work on any semen stain that might be left behind that hadn't been used up, and try and get an improved profile using the up-to-date then DNA technique. Fortunately, I was able to find some semen staining left over from Melanie's trousers, and we were able to get the up-to-date DNA profile at that point. We got very close. It wasn't a full profile, but it was very nearly. An improved DNA profile was a good lead, but it still wasn't enough to point them to the killer. Would Melanie's murderer ever be brought to justice? We had an almost complete profile we're thinking the offender injured himself. That's most useful to us because what it's saying is it was unlikely a consensual act and someone else has murdered her. And therefore, this was the offender's DNA we had. All we had to do was identify the right person to swab. So, you know, everyone was excited at the prospect. Detectives believed they were getting closer. Determined to crack the case, on the 25th anniversary of Melanie's murder, police turned to Crime Watch. They didn't predict the response they would get. For a quarter of a century, Melanie's family have had to live with the knowledge that her killer has never been caught. 
the reconstruction of what police believe to be Melanie's route home and the tragic events of that night sparked an influx of calls, providing the investigation with 80 new names. One caller was of particular interest. He claimed to have actually spoken to the killer just moments after the attack. Twenty-five years on, here was a brand new witness. But would his information provide the breakthrough police had been waiting so long for? Next week in the hunt for Melanie Rhodes' killer. He said to the man, have you just had an argument with your girlfriend? 97.5% sure it's going to be here. It's known in the business as a screamer. I just knew that I was going to solve it. Such an awful case for Melanie's poor family. Do join us next week to see how the extraordinary investigation progresses. OK, time for a last check on what sort of calls we've had tonight. Tina? Yeah, the phone lines are very busy inside the mobile incident room. Let's grab a very quick word with Detective Superintendent Paul Durham. How's tonight been for you? Yeah, we've been very busy. A lot of good calls coming through, particularly sightings of the EFITs and people putting names to those faces. So it's really good. important we find these two men, isn't it? Absolutely, and focus on those visible injuries. OK, and Jim, you've had calls, but not the crucial one that you need. Oh, well, it still urges, urges people to get in touch with us. You know, it's been 20 years, and, you know, we're particularly interested in the identity of that EFIT. OK, thank you very much indeed. Well, that's everything for now on BBC One, but you can follow all of the developments on our new Live Updates webpage. Head there for the very latest from the detectives as they chase up all the calls still coming in behind me. The phone lines, they open until midnight tomorrow, so please call if you can help. Next week, we'll have exclusive new developments in one of Britain's most notorious murders, plus a shocking investigation into the appalling rise in hate crime. As soon as I got on the tram and the doors had shut and the announcements had finished, straight away I could hear um, a lot of vulgar language. It instantly turned very nasty. You understand how hated you really are in England? On the days we were targeted, we, we for about 10, 10, 11 days, we had to pull our phone lines out. That's all next week, Monday at 9 on BBC One. But for now, thank you so much for all of your calls so far. They really do make a difference. From everyone here at RAF Marham, goodbye.